let's get started. Um, thanks again for coming um, here on Monday morning. Um, <coughs> so uh, there are some announcements. Um, exercise zero, your grades are in your inbox. Um, if you don't find it, let me know, right? Uh, because otherwise there's some problem. Um, exercise one, the deadline was yesterday. I think uh, every group has submitted, so that's good. Um, they will be graded. Um, so Arnas is, Arnas is in charge of that. So um, I haven't talked to him, so um, I'll see when the, the grading will be done. Okay. Um, and there will be a recap session next Monday. Um, yeah, after the lecture. And for exercise, exercise two, um, you have the uh, questions available, so you can find them on the web. And there will be an introduction tutorial today. <coughs> so what we are going to do today is uh, the OD generalization, um, adversarial attack. Actually, we are going to do a bit of um, adversarial defense this time. Um, and afterwards, we'll jump to the second part of the lecture, explainability. So let's start with the defense first, right? So the typical framework that you come up with here is a uh, game theory. So you have um, players, and uh, we let them play a game. It's not like an entertainment, but it's like a theory, right? Um, you have two players, and um, they have some sometimes um, yeah, comp competitive goals. So if one side is winning, the other side is losing. Uh, it's called zero-sum game, right? And uh, they're picking their own strategies to kind of uh, optimize their games, right? And they have to kind of um, make a choice which is, uh, which is adaptive to the other person's choice. So if you have more knowledge about what the other person is trying to choose, then um, you can make better choices that benefits you. Um, and also, it's also beneficial, it's of interest of the players to, um, to choose a strategy which is kind of unexpected for the other person. So that's kind of the idea behind two-person um, zero-sum game in general. And uh, we are taking that framework here because uh, adversarial attack and defense is, uh, is very much like, a, uh, can very much well be explained um, according to this player, two-player game. Uh, so we have a um, full pipeline here. So on the left, you start with an original input, and then there's an um, adversary who comes in and transforms the, uh, the input. Right, so uh, using the relevant knowledge for the attacker, they're going to make an attack based on the given input. And then um, the adversarial input is then given to the recognition model. And uh, the, the defender in this case is the service provider who wants to still be able to recognize the input as well. So there's an attacker with user trying to make adversary perturbation, and there's a defender who's trying to still recognize the object. Um, so that was the conceptual background for thinking about what defense is doing. And uh, let's come up with some simple defenses that's going to um, um, remove some adversarial effects. Um, you know, like when, when there is an adversarial perturbation on the image input, these are typically very tiny changes in the, in the images, right? So actually, um, they're also very fragile uh, because these are like anomalies which are um, kind of only existent in a very small pocket of input space. So um, let's say when you do some blurring of the image, then these adver adversarial effects typically go away. And actually, if you think about what, um, uh, what typical image recognition models do when they recognize an image, um, well, not every model does that, but um, many of the models actually 
crop um, some parts of the image, right? And then do, does the prediction on each of the crop, and then um, combine the outputs from all these crops. Um, so this this is kind of the um, technique that you do to maximize the performance of the image recognition. And uh, if you do that, then what's happening for each patch is uh, you take the crop of each patch and then you rescale um, the patch size to the, uh, to the input size of the network and then um, pass through the network to get the output, right? So in that process, there's a cropping operation and resizing operation. And the, the claim here is that these operations are sufficient to actually remove adversarial effects. Okay, um, so that's a very simple defense. Like you don't actually have to do anything special to remove the adversarial effect. You just apply the typical pipeline, and um, the adversarial effect is gone. Okay. The second example is a bit depth reduction. So you know um, we're typically using 255 values of RGB values. Well, 256, right, including zero. Um, to represent each pixel, right? Um, but instead of having uh, like 256 possibilities of values, you can choose to have less bits. You can reduce that to seven bits and have 128, or go even lower than that, right? That's actually not gonna change the appearance of the image so much. But uh, these small perturbations are sufficient to remove the adversarial effect again. Uh, right, so that's again bit depth reduction. Um, third example is JPEG encoding and decoding. JPEG is the most common way to compress an image. So when you um, transmit an image to someone else or make it into a file, uh, the format for, um, for saving this image is JPEG, right? Uh, so there is encoding stage where you do a discrete Fourier transform and so on, and then um, does some, yeah. Um, compression of the information, right? And then you do decoding to, um, to reconstruct the RGB values per pixel. Um, in the process, there's some loss of information, of course. Um, if it's a lossy compression, hello. Um, so by losing information, maybe the adversarial effect goes away, right? So because JPEG encoding is something that almost everyone does. Again, um, this is a very simple way to remove um, adversarial effects. Okay, so in common, um, they don't affect recognition performance of models in general, but uh, they're potentially very effective for removing adversarial effects. If you look at the results, um, this is from one of the papers uh, who came up with this uh, simple defense, right? Um, so you have, um, fast gradient sign method as an attack. If you don't do anything on top of the image, then you have the um, dashed curve there, uh, which corresponds to no defense, and the x-axis is the strength of the attack, the L infinity norm of the attack, right? So if, you, if it's zero, then you have the original accuracy, which is a 76%, and as you increase the size of the gradient, size of the attack, the accuracy goes down to uh, something like 10%. Uh, I guess that's the random baseline, random chance baseline. So the attack is effective, first of all, but now if you apply, let's say, a crop ensemble, which is uh, doing the cropping and resizing of different uh, patches and then combining the outputs of these uh, individual patches, right? If you do that, you have the red curve on the top, um, which does not decrease um, as much in terms of. Um, uh, recognition score, right? Likewise for other types of um, defenses like total variation minimization, which I didn't actually um, explain here. Um, you don't need to know it. Uh, but there is also bit depth reduction and JPEG compression, um, which have kind of similar effects. Okay, so, so far so good. Um, but now, um, with those kind of defenses, uh, let's say the adversary actually knows that these defenses are in place, right? 
um, or maybe uh, these defenses are not intentionally put there, but you know that um, somewhere in the pipeline, these kind of uh, perturba additional perturbations on the input will be there, and so you expect the adversarial effect to be uh, much less significant, right? With that knowledge, um, you can kind of increase your relevant knowledge as an adversary to um, the method the defense side is taking, right? So if the attacker actually knows the, not just the model, right? So it's not just the white box model, but actually they know the defense, right? So it's slightly more stronger than just white box model. Um, then what you can do is uh, you can try to treat the input transformation as part of the model, right? And then um, attack this in extended model, so to say. So let's say uh, um, yeah, the defender is using cropping and rescaling, right? Um, so on the first part of the net, this extended network, you're going to have a layer which is doing cropping and um, rescaling. And then after that, you have the original model. Right. Um, yeah, again, you treat this whole uh, pipeline as a white box model and then attack it. And uh, you realize now that uh, cropping and rescaling is a differentiable operation. So you can also um, backpropagate through the uh, cropping and rescaling operations. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's an attack, right? And um, of course, there are some non smooth um, defenses like quantization or JPEG encoding and decoding. So uh, for those kind of transformations, you cannot directly generate gradients. So um, if you do naive um, backpropagation, you're not gonna get any signal to, to attack the, the image. So what can you do here? Um, you can do some differentiation through the quantization line, differentiation through um, non-smooth um, functions. So this is called um, straight through estimator, uh, which is a fancy name, but actually um, it's just the name people put on a super simple um, operation or methodology. So uh, let's say, so this is an example of what I mean by straight through estimator. So you have a, let's say a JPEG transformation. Um, and in PyTorch, you define the forward path, and uh, you don't normally define backward by yourself because the backward is uh, inferred by automatic differentiation. Um, but you can kind of uh, override the backward um, process here because otherwise the backward will always generate zero tensors, right? So on the forward path, you see uh, there's a JPEG encoding first, right? And then JPEG decoding here, right? Um, but you realize actually um, these sets of operations are uh, very close to identical identity operation, right? You're almost not doing, you're almost um, leaving the image as is, right? So the idea is um, for backwards, you just have, um, have an identity function. So you're treating um, as if um, the forward was identity, and then um, using the backwards, uh, which is the gradient of the identity, which is also identity. Yeah. So that's called straight through estimator. You have whatever function uh, for the forward pass, but for the backward pass, you always apply an um, identity function. Yeah. So that's the way um, you still attack this uh, non-smooth. Um, defenses. So now, from the defender side, they can uh, still do something, right? And try to decrease the random of knowledge for the attacker. How is this possible, right? Um, the answer is randomization. Even if the attacker kind of knows what possibilities uh, the defender may have, um, the defender can kind of randomize the, um, um, the choices. So this, this is a typical defense strategy for game theory. If you think uh, the adversary knows too much, then you can kind of randomize your choices. And um, if the choice is random, then um, yeah, it, even the worst case enemies 
um, not, do not know uh, what you're going to do. Even yourself do not know what you're going to do, right? So that's for sure decreasing everyone's knowledge. Okay, so um, what kind of strategies using random, random, yeah, randomness can you use here? Um, so for example, there are many possibilities, but here um, you can also do random composition of um, transformations. You know, like as I said, uh, um, the, uh, the operations here are very close to identity functions. So even if you apply many of these operations, you still um, retain quite a bit of original information. So you're not going to see super huge drop in performance by applying so many um, transformations. Um, and also you do that at random. So you apply k different transformations, but these are uh, randomly sampled from the set of possibilities. Okay, but now um, the attacker may still fight back, right? So what, what's the strategy for the attacker to kind of address the randomness, right? Um, and now I'm going to talk about a method called EOT. Um, EOT stands for expectation over transformations. Um, well, it's not a general technique, it's more like a, a technique specific to this kind of uh, this setting. Um, so you're basically uh, taking the gradient against um, the expectation. So in other words, you are taking an ensemble of possible transformations and then attacking this ensemble um, altogether. Um, in other words, you are taking the uh, average of the gradients from every um, transformation that you are applying on the uh, on the image. So that strengthens, strengthens the attacker quite a bit against the random um, defender. Um, so yeah, if there is a, a randomness, then what you do is you attack everything at the same time. Um, and here the, um, the constraint is your capacity, the attacker's capacity, right? Um, you can think of the pixel space as some kind of um, capacity like a, like a storage where you can um, encode information to attack the target model and actually if you have to attack the target attack many of the targets then um, you have to find a smaller kind of pocket of attack right um, and that becomes increasingly hard when you have to kind of attack many models um, right or address many possible defenses or transformations um, so as long as there's a small pocket that's uh, possibly attacking a lot of models, you can defend against all, sorry, attack against all these models, right? So you're kind of relying on this uh, possibility of a small um, attack space, which is effective against all, all the other defenses. Um, so I was primarily talking about images so, so far, um, but the similar kind of logic happens with uh, language models. So we've seen uh, universal and transferable jailbreaks, right? It actually came out um, very recently, like, yeah, I don't actually remember, was it uh, September or August or something, right? And now there are already defenses against these attacks, right? Which is very remarkable. But actually, these defenses are not super sophisticated. These are, again, uh, basic defenses, like baseline defenses that you can just think of on the spot. Um, so what you can do is, uh, when you have uh, this kind of input with adversarial suffix, you know, like, what you can do is uh, you pass the sentence through some par paraphrasing model, right? Or you can just ask a language model to paraphrase the input to some other input. And then use that input for prompting the model again. And uh, by paraphrasing, you have actually removed all the adversarial effect from the input. So that's it. Very similar idea. Um, and as a side note as well, but this is actually examinable still, 
Um, I, I wish to also talk, talk about adversarial training, because that's, uh, uh, I would say, that's, that's the most popular defense against adversarial um, attacks. Uh, what you do is you train the model with adversarial attacks on the fly. You're augmenting your uh, training data with adversarial examples. Okay, so this is called adversarial training. If you write down the formula for that, you have um, the original training um, ERM, which looks like you're taking the arc mean of over theta over the average across all the training data for the loss, right? But now for adversarial training, um, you are training across all the training samples. Um, but for every training sample, you're now sampling the worst case uh, sample, which is kind of maximizing the loss uh, within the neighborhood of the original training input. So you realize that this is actually a nested optimization. So uh, the outer loop is kind of similar, but you have an inner loop as well, or inner optimization as well, where you need to find a attacking sample for every training sample. So at a glance, it Indeed, it looks like very expensive. So when you talk about adversarial training, you always need to think about and talk about um, efficacy and cost. There is a big trade-off here. Um, so kind of the topics to think about here is uh, what is the um, um, increase in computational requirements for computing, uh, for doing adversarial training. Um, is there any um, kind of what is the factor of um, increasing the per batch memory and speed consumption, right? Memory consumption and speed decrease, right? Um, that means um, um, how many, so highly related to that is uh, the number of times you have to do uh, forward passes and backward passes per batch, right? For um, generating adversarial sam samples, you, let's say you're using PGD attack for generating um, samples, and um, for every batch, you have to do um, k times forward and backwards to generate the, um, the attack for this batch of samples, right? Um, instead of just once, right? Uh, which is required for doing normal um, SGD training for the, for the original model, right? So that's like uh, per batch, you have to do almost k times uh, forward and backward passes. And that's super expensive. Uh, number of training iterations, um, that matters because, for example, uh, let's say it takes 100 epochs to, until convergence for your original model. But now, uh, with the adversarial examples, the learning problem is significantly harder. And so you probably need twice or three times more um, training epochs until convergence. And that adds to the uh, total training time for this adversarial training. Uh, what about inference speed? After training a training model, is there any change in inference speed? Most likely not, right? Because you, you have already trained a model and um, the training weights have all the information about, um, yeah, um, about uh, how to deal with adversarial samples. Um, but uh, the inference time itself does not necessarily change because you have the same um, size of the model and so on, and you're doing the same kind of computation. Um, yeah, but, but perhaps for adversarial training, you need to introduce more um, bigger network uh, with more capacity to handle the, uh, the variations that you are introducing with the, uh, well, your training data is more complex with the adversarial samples, so to, to handle this higher complexity, you also need in general, higher complexity model. Um, so, so, for, for example, example, instead of RASNAP, people use wide RASNAP, for example. And uh, if you do that, of course, then there's an increase in infant speed. Um, so, probably you've kind of you had an idea of this, right? Already um, that uh, there's an attacker sign and there's a defender sign and. Whenever uh, one side is coming up with some method, the other side is uh, uh, countering that or getting, like, doing the adaption, right, against the other side. 
Um, and there's no real answer to this, right? So there's cat and there's mouse, and yeah, uh, one side say, yeah, we found an attack, and then the other side says, um, yeah, but there's an easy defense, and this kind of continues on and on. Uh, so this is non examinable, but um, this is a brief history of adverse server robustness until 2018, I think. So there was first attack, and then there, there are tons of work from the attack side at first, right? Because that's more interesting. And now um, there was uh, 2016, there was some defense. And then um, the, the sides, the two sides start to fight against each other, right? So there was a strong attack, and then there was a strong defense adversarial training. And then um, some people say, yeah, it's actually easy to bypass adversarial detection methods. Um, and then um, on the right side, people say, yeah, um, actually you can defend adversarial attacks in tons of different ways. And then um, there was a critical paper at Aguilar 18 saying, um, it's called Obfuscated Gradients, saying that actually, um, was that eight or nine different methods that came out um, at Aguilar 17 or something? And then this Aguilar 18 paper said, yeah, actually, uh, seven out of nine defense methods there are not effective. Um, so that was a big uh, kind of uh, claim that these people made. Um, and that didn't actually uh, successfully kill all the attempts to defend the model. And there was a paper called BART, for example, uh, which argued that, yeah, there is an effect called obfuscated gradients, which makes the defense ineffective, but still we found a effective defense, right? And, yeah, and this goes on and on, right? And then we see the same trend in 2023 and 24. Um, so with this um, universal and transferable adversarial suffix paper, um, there are really uh, quite a bit of um, work against these kind of attacks, right? Language model attacks, saying there are actually good defense strategies against these uh, attacks. Um, so I feel like, uh, yeah, this is a cat and mouse game and um, it's not going anywhere, right? Um, so the question is, where are we actually going? Um, because um, if we come back to the original motivation here, um, uh, which is machine learning security, it's still a very um, important problem, right? So you cannot just neglect um, the existence of possible adversaries and yeah, you have to kind of do something about that. Um, but the lesson here is that um, ultimately defense is, like perfect defense is not possible, right? Because um, there's always a, there's no guarantee that you can defend against all possible adversaries. Adversaries can become very, very resource, resourceful and rely on different ways of attacking. Um, or finding different attack surfaces to, um, to still break down the system. Um, but still on the way, we have learned a few practical lessons and advice for um, addressing possible adversaries. So on the right side, we, um, I put uh, figures, so, right? So, so the prompt here is a cat and mouse game, right? And uh, I, I'm putting two figures here because that kind of shows how much progress we have made um, in the AI field um, uh, for the last 12 months, right? So DALI 2 used to make, uh, uh, now it looks a little too, um, too low quality um, compared to DALI 3 um, output. So to me, that's very impressive. Um, so what are the practical adv advice we can give to machine learning security practitioners, right? Um, so the rule of thumb is that when you service a model, the model has to be a black box, right? Otherwise, you are exposing way too much information about what you're doing, and um, you're, you're exposing way too much um, attack surfaces. Because even if the model is black box model, there are tons of possibilities to attack this model still, right? So if all the model details are there, then it's very likely that uh, your model is, will continuously be attacked by all kinds of people. 
Um, so it's not just the model uh, weights themselves that you should not um, publish, but also uh, there's training data set, architecture and optimization details. Uh, so perhaps it's better to kind of not disclose everything if your uh, machine learning ap application is uh, critical, security critical. And um, um, also, especially if your um, training data is based on um, some user data, for example, or uh, some proprietary data. And um, yeah, still content filtering is a good, simple and effective tool to defend against um, the majority of attacks, right? So let's say if you have adversarial suffix, you know that something is wrong, right, from the model side, and you can easily kind of um, defend or kind of filter out these kind of inputs. Um, and also you have to update the model periodi periodically to um, adapt to new types of attacks. And uh, it's better to maintain an internal red team who's attacking the model inside. And you should also get uh, feedback from the community who's using the model to update the model. So yeah, that's sort of the idea. Um, in theory, um, is there any possibility to move forward, right? So one possibility is a uh, certified defense, um, where you try to find the um, find the space of attacks where you do not anymore find any effective attack against certain models. So in other words, you're trying to come up with a model uh, which comes with the guarantee that within a small uh, limited subset around some inputs, um, there's no possible attack at all. This is called certified defense. And uh, the problem here is that this ensures safety. And so, um, against those specific type of attacks, you're sure that there's going to be no attack. But of course, the con is that um, the, the possible attack spaces that they assume is uh, small. So the guarantee is only for a small uh, limited set. Uh, maybe uh, what's also practical here is something called randomized defense that we mentioned uh, briefly before. Um, it also tends to be effective, but the problem is um, the, the space where you randomize the, um, the defenses, right? Um, your defenses are still assuming some possible attacks, and if the attacker is kind of moving far beyond the expected realm of possible attacks, then your defense may not be effective anymore. Um, some other alternative research directions. Um, so instead of studying these kind of worst case attacks, but um, we can also take a look at more realistic natural distribution shifts. And this uh, brings us back to um, the old generalization task that we were looking at before, like domain generalization or cross-wise generalization. Okay, so with that, we close the first part of the lecture and move on to explainability. So we start with a system, right? It's a very simple uh, diagram. There's an input and there's an output. Um, what's an example of a system? So if you're familiar with how um, policy rates and inflation and um, uh, the Fed rates and ECB rates work, you know, like they are doing um, this kind of, they are tweaking the mechanism or they are tweaking some of the parameters um, in terms of policies to derive some desired outcome, uh, which in this case is, uh, is the uh, rate of inflation, like how the price increases over time. And also, uh, yeah, of course, their other goal is employment. Um, but let's talk about price control here. Um, economists tend to have very good understanding of how things work. Like when they turn some knob, uh, what's going to happen um, downstream? Of course, they didn't, they didn't know it uh, perfectly every time. And of course, there are a lot of volatilities which make the price control super hard. But still, they have a broad idea of um, uh, at least they know the directions, right? When they increase the rates, uh, 
whether the price will go up or down, right? Um, and inside uh, this uh, reasoning, they have um, kind of different modules playing um, kind of um, uh, the, the mechanisms of different modules inside the economic uh, vehicle, this machine, right? So if they raise uh, interest rates, um, they are also setting expectations for the future. At the same time, they are making the money borrowing kind of more expensive, for example. And then that affects um, the money, credit, asset prices, bank rates, and exchange rates, everything, right? And eventually, through a um, combination of these effects, um, you're going to eventually see uh, how the prices change. So this kind of mechanism is uh, kind of well known. Um, and if they know um, the system super well, then it's easier to control the system. And that's the, that's the logic behind um, yeah, this uh, price control. Um, but if the internal mechanism is kind of not known, then um, it's again a black box system. We've seen that in um, adversarial attacks. And a good example of a black box system is a um, self-driving car, for example. Um, so the, the car used to go um, follow the path, right? But in some conditions, um, the car decided not to follow the path. And so you wish to kind of control this phenomenon, but you don't exactly know how to control it because you don't know what's going on inside the system. So that's the problem with uh, machine learning in general, right? Um, we need uh, better explainability to eventually um, improve the models or fix something. Um, so if you ask me why do you need explainability, I would say, yeah, um, there are some applications where um, you need to make the model do the right thing. Um, for example, choose the right features to, to generalize. Um, it's important for fairness and demographic biases, for example. Um, it's also important for generalizing beyond the training data. Or um, related, but um, in a slightly different um, fashion, you also need it for debugging model. Um, your question is, why does the model make a mistake in this particular sense? Or um, you wish to know, um, well, you have a failure case, and uh, which feature was contributing to this failure? Because only by knowing that you can control it later on and fix the feature or something, or fix the model to, um, to ignore the feature. Um, the same kind of question could be asked for training samples. Um, but not only that, uh, right, um, it's kind of needed for better HCI. HCI here stands for human computer interaction. Um, eventually, you're, you're a human, and um, machine is a machine, right? So um, if the interface between the two is just uh, the outcomes from the model, then um, you're not satisfactory. You're not satisfied by the answer. Um, you want not just the answer from the model, but also the uh, supporting exam explanations. Uh, you need the supporting explanation for the sake of understanding itself as well sometimes. Um, there's a trend for machine learning for science. Um, if machine learning model is just yeah, doing, doing super well in predictions. Um, that's not, I mean, that's still very interesting practically, but also from a um, science perspective. You probably want to know the internal mechanisms, right? Um, the new kind of rules that the machine has learned that humans did not uh, realize from the from a very high dimensional data. Uh, also, sometimes you wish to know whether the model has used any private or copyrighted training samples in generative models. That's also a very important question. Um, or you wish to know whether the model is truly compositional and truly generalizing to new cases or just memorizing the, the cases. And in turn, um, those kind of um, information leads to better um, trust, user trust. 
Um, if you ask people why do you not use, um, well, if you ask doctors why do you not use machine learning, um, or why do you not use chatbots for your, uh, so let, let, uh, let patients just talk to chatbots instead of doctors. Why, why do they not do that? Because they don't, I mean, doctors do not trust the chatbots um, yet, right? And also patients do not trust the chatbots yet. And uh, part of the reason is because the, the models do not explain itself. Um, it makes some predictions, but do not explain how it uh, reached that uh, conclusion. So for, um, uh, for uh, safety critical domains like finance, law, uh, medical applications, it's important to, um, to give reasons for wider applicability. And of course, uh, yeah, GDPR, kind of boring, but still, yeah, um, necessary topic. Uh, so it's a basic right for data subjects these days. So, you know, like there's even a clause in GDPR saying um, when a critical decision is made against a data subject, then the data subjects uh, can uh, ask for explanation behind it. And if there's no tool um, in the machine model to generate an expl explanation in the first place, then you are violate, violating this uh, fundamental um, clause or fundamental rights of data subjects. So it's a necessity from legal perspective as well. Yeah, this is an example of that. So the credit um, assessment uh, pipeline, right? So if the loan was loan application was declined, then um, yeah, if there's an automated system behind it, then um, they have all the rights to ask for the reasoning behind it. And um, typically, um, they're citing um, three different barriers to transparency. I think um, yeah, these are nice points, so it's worth thinking about them a little bit. So. One possible failure case is uh, um, the service provider is concealing the information intentionally, right? Um, the decision-making process is uh, kind of kept secret for whatever reason. Um, or even if they explain the full reason why, why the law is rejected, for example, um, the, the, the person may not be able to understand um, the content. I mean, the, the, um, uh, the bank can just, just give them the code, right? Uh, or the, or the machine, machine learning ways uh, for determining um, um, the, the assessment, right? Uh, but for general people, they don't actually understand the Python code. And of course, if you're just getting the weights from a model, then how can you understand what's going on here? So there's uh, gaps in technical literacy. Um, there's also mismatch. I think that's more, um, so, so being unable to understand the, the ways is more um, of a case for the third case, mismatch between how models work and the capacity of human intelligence. Um, human intelligence is not working in um, dense linear predictions. So if you just look at a dense set of ways, you do not actually understand what's going on. Uh, yeah, and um, so let's try to characterize when explanation is needed. Actually, there is a single answer to this, in my opinion. Uh, let me expand upon uh, the single answer. So my claim is that explanation is needed when things do not work, when things fail. Um, so to see that, uh, let's think uh, for a split seconds when do we not need any explanation. I would say uh, you don't need an explanation if uh, you have an AI that's suggesting a, uh, a song on a streaming platform, let's say. You don't really need to know the reasoning why, why, uh, why this particular song was uh, predicted. Of course, you, you may have some interest in knowing the reasoning behind it and possibly fixing the algorithm if possible, uh, controlling it, but it's not as critical as uh, other um, or security critical applications, I would say. So here, there is no significant, uh, significant consequences or unacceptable results. Um, 
And also, um, there is a navigation app um, just choosing the fastest route. And here, we, don't, we rarely question why this route was chosen, chosen and so on, uh, because it used to work so well, right? So you are now kind of trusting the model. So, yeah. Again, uh, if things work, do not work out and it costs you a lot, then you start questioning why. So let's start the uh, second part, uh, first section, um, definition. So I'm going to start with a uh, characterization of the, the capacity of human understanding. What can we actually understand, right? Obviously, we cannot understand um, the internal parameters of a deep neural network, right? But if you look at simple functions, we do understand certain simple functions. Uh, we have a shopping list, right? I want to buy apples, bread, and milk. But we know the prices of each item. Then uh, the total cost is the linear uh, combination of these, uh, the number of items, right? So it's a linear function, and uh, I would say this is interpretable. And no one, no one, I guess, will disagree with that. So, so we have two data points. So we have a linear model, and we have a deep neural network. We understand linear model. We do not understand deep neural network. So where is the boundary in between? So yeah, this is called sparse linear function. Uh, you have a linear function, but you do not have a lot of coefficients. Because if you have too many coefficients, then you do not understand the model again. Um, now, let's say uh, there are some um, 1D nonlinear functions. You have quadratic function, you have exponential function, you have logarithmic function, you have some sine function. I would say I still understand these functions. I can interpret what these are doing, okay? Because I cannot, I can uh, make some everyday life analogies or uh, some physical metaphors to understand it. Um, another, another example I didn't put it here is uh, sparse polynomials, right? Um, you have polynomial here, and that's something that we kind of understand. Oops. Um, I would say simple decision trees are interpretable as well. Uh, let's say we start from some, um, some roots node and then um, we try to tell if, um, if the object is tall or short, right, and so on. Um, and then eventually uh, on the leaf nodes you're going to see if, if the animal is a squirrel or a rat and so on, right? And we kind of understand the decision process in this case. Um, another type of function is an enumeration of all possible outputs or all possible inputs. If the input complexity is not huge, let's say there are just two variables and two um, with binary variables, um, then I would say um, I do understand what's going on here. Although uh, it's a little dubious whether you can say um, memorization is understanding. But still, um, if you ask me uh, what's going to happen if you change x1 to from 0 to 1, I can answer your question, for example. So that, I would say, is uh, sort of interpretable. But of course, if you increase the number of inputs here, then it becomes uninterpretable again, because that goes beyond the human capacity. And now, um, some examples of non-interpretable uh, functions. So let's say there's a financial model for revenue prediction for a company uh, based on a linear model. So it's a simple linear model still, right? You just um, take the product between coefficients and the input and then sum them together. Um, the process itself, itself is simple, um, but if you look at the possible uh, features here, you have sales figures from different regions, so there, there can be a lot of different regions here. Uh, marketing span across various channels, so you're going to have a bunch of channels, right? So eventually you're going to have like hundreds of entries um, as an input. You're going to have an Excel table with hundreds of columns. And eventually you're going to put different weights to different entries here, and then you're going to generate the final revenue function. I would say this is not interpretable. 
because humans do not have the capacity to remember all these uh, inputs and un really understand what's going on inside. Um, likewise, if you enumerate all the possible input output pairs for um, a huge input space, then yeah, it's not interpretable again. Um, if you go to um, neural networks and stack nonlinearities, um, things get um, not interpretable very quickly. Even with just a two layer neural network with two input variables and two hidden variables, uh, you sort of have a um, non interpretable kind of function um, right away. Uh, so if you write down the equation here, you have ReLU applied on top of some affine transformation, and the same for the second variable, and then you sum them up, and right, that's the final output. It's really hard to describe or understand what's going on, and it's hard to reason what's going to happen if your input changes from this value to the other value. Um, and of course, um, if you go more complex, like deep neural network or transformers or uh, diffusion models. I mean, you can describe globally what's happening, right? Uh, for example, transformer is doing a multi-head attention and then you're doing some normalization and on top you're gonna put some loss function and you're doing it autoregressively or you just have encoding function. You can still say something, but you do not truly understand the entire mechanisms happening inside. Um, so indeed, uh, we have a full spectrum of interpretable and non-interpretable. And I think the boundary is very blurry and uh, very subjective as well. Depending on who you're talking to, people will say different answers. Um, but I hope this exposes some of the criteria that we use for saying whether something is interpretable and not, right? So with this kind of a feeling, let's move on to the next uh, topics. Um, so the section topic or the part topic is uh, explainability. Why do you talk about interpretability? What is the difference, right? So interpretability is about the function itself, right? Um, whether a function is um, understandable to humans uh, without any additional explanation module, uh, whether it's in itself understandable by humans. So, yeah, also the other important question is whether the function's complexity is within human, uh, human's intellectual capacities. So, interpretability is about the function itself, while explanation is an, is an additional action you're taking to uh, to turn potentially non-interpretable function into an interpretable function, okay? Uh, so explanation is a human action, right? Um, we are trying to convey the internal mechanisms of this model to someone else. Um, so I would say explanation is a human to, or a machine to human explanations, right? Um, I wish to talk about um, eventually how to say whether an explanation is good or not, basically an evaluation. And for that, uh, let's try to, so I'm gonna do the def definition of explanation and the uh, definition of evaluation methodologies at the same time. Um, and also the, the practical utility of explanation. So all of these are intertwined, so it's kind of hard to discuss one thing at a time. Um, so I'm going to start with the eventual purpose of these explanations. So there are two purposes in general, in my opinion. So there is one um, for better human-computer interaction, uh, which is for building trust, and uh, you try to make the machine outputs more human-friendly, or make it more like, um, like a human, you're talking to a human. Um, for model developers, they need um, explanations to improve the model um, and also debug a model when you think there's a problem. 
and you also gain a bit more knowledge of what's going on inside, like whether the model is using some weird trained data. Um, this is non-examinable, and uh, I like to talk a little bit about how humans explain to each other, because that's the uh, source of um, ideas for how one could build an explanation module uh, from a machine learning model to a human. There's a really nice uh, paper from Tim Miller. Uh, it's called Explanation in Artificial Intelligence Insights from the Social Sciences, right? So in social science, people do study uh, what, what, what it means to explain something, what it means to answer the why question. And here, uh, explanation is defined as an answer to why question. Um, so if you wish to work in this domain, um, this is one of the must reads, I would say. Um, why do humans need explanation in the first place? Uh, two main reasons. One um, is to find a meaning, right? To basically to understand. Um, this is a tool for reconciling contradictions or inconsistencies. Uh, everyone has some prior beliefs, right? But when there's a, then there's a data which is contradicting your prior belief, then you start asking questions. Where does that uh, mismatch come from? Is it coming from um, my, my perception? Or is it coming from my logical reasoning? Or is it coming from uh, some deception from the, from the data? Um, the second reason is more social, right? So you wish to understand um, the other person's belief, right? You ask the why question to understand what the other person is believing in, and try to be on the same page, right? Um, if we are kind of sharing different principles, then we can say, yeah, you don't share the values. Um, you're not part of the team anymore. I'm gonna find someone else to work with, for example. Or um, if it turns out that uh, we basically have the same value system, and we can actually work together very well, then we kind of clear out all the misunderstandings and um, kind of start from there, right? That's why people ask why questions. Um, so they also identify um, three key characteristics of human-to-human -human explanations. Um, one is con contrastive. Second is selective, and third is uh, social, context-dependent, and interactive. They are all um, intermingled concepts. Um, so I'll go one by one. What do I mean by contrastive explanations? Explanations are sought in response to a particular counterfactual cases. Um, so when people ask, uh, why did event P happen? You're not just ask, asking that, but actually there's always a hidden, um, hidden part of the sentence, which is telling you, um, which is asking you why did P happen instead of Q. Um, so likewise in explainable AI, we need to kind of specify instead of asking why did this model predict this, um, you need to identify instead of what, right? Um, so here are some examples. It's called FOIL, right? The other alternative case is called FOIL. Um, so if there's a question like uh, everyday question, uh, why did Elizabeth open the door? There are many possible FOILs, um, which is kind of clear from the context, but um, if you're kind of out of context and you have to ask the, the questioner again, what do you mean by the question, right? Instead of what are you asking? So why did Elizabeth open the door rather than leave it closed, for example? Or why did Elizabeth open the door rather than the window? Or why did Elizabeth open the door rather than Michael opening it, for example? Um, so that was for simple fact, but now for functions, you have um, a bit more possibilities, uh, which is actually our interest. So instead of asking why does f output y for input x, um, you should specify why does f of y rather than y prime, uh, which is not an output, for the same input. 
Or why does f output y for input x while it outputs y prime for another input x prime, right? So let's say uh, the input was, um, the style of the input has changed, right? And uh, the output is completely broken. And you're asking why, why that happens, right? So instead of just asking, uh, yeah, um, for this style, the model is failing, right? Which is super annoying. Um, and you should ask, yeah, why, why does the model output this? Well, in the previous case, when the model was uh, doing well on this particular input, um, the, the non-style transferred input, the, the output was normal. Or the other question you can ask is, uh, why does f output y for input x, while another function f prime outputs y for x, okay? For the same uh, input, different functions may output different outputs. Um, and different function here could be the case where you actually change the training data. So if you change the training data, the, um, the output of the network will be slightly different as well. And um, you're asking why, why does that happen, right? And that's a uh, more valid question than just asking why the model outputs particular output for, uh, for an input. So you see that uh, all of these questions are framed for some extraordinary phenomena rather than something that goes um, according to your expectations, right? And second, selectiveness. Um, you basically should not overwhelm the, uh, the questioner with all, by citing all possible uh, causes. So in reality, the, the, the causal graph of things happening is super complicated. If you raise the fat rate, then um, it's actually making uh, tons of, it affects tons of possible variables in the economic kind of network. And um, if you're citing every possible sources there, then it's worse than not, uh, worse than no information. So you should be able to uh, pick out the key um, factors that's actually making um, uh, relevant. So humans are very good at this. So they're good at selecting one or two causes that are making big, uh, big impact on the output. And uh, for a machine learning model, it's also very important that we still keep the explanation simple and within the capacity of human intellect. And now finally, uh, there's a social aspect of it. Um, we tend to kind of model the other person before answering the why question. We try to um, use the context to understand the foil, right, for example, or we try to um, estimate the prior belief of the person. So we try to um, explain in terms of why that happens contrary to the, the prior belief that the other person may have in the first place. Um, and machine models as well, they will be better if they also have some internal model of the, the user, right? And be able to explain, contrary to what the user might expect, um, the model predicts this because of blah, blah, right? And for that, it's important for the model to have more knowledge about the person and that is possible through interactions. If you're just having a single conversation or uh, if, if uh, it's unilateral um, output of the model to the user, then there's no possibility for the model to adapt to the user. So in general, it's quite important to have a kind of a interactive system uh, where the user can better define um, the kind of answer that the user wants to get. So I, yeah, okay, so this is the final um, kind of summarization of um, these requirements. So this is an interesting YouTube video that kind of encapsulates all the, um, all the points that I mentioned. So the, the, the interviewer is asking Richard Feynman uh, a basic question like, why does the magnet push against each other, right? Something like that, right? And then the Richard Feynman, instead of answering the question, um, goes on for 10 minutes, 20 minutes on uh, how, how, um, how invalid the question is. And um, the, the why question should be, 
kind of more specific, basically, um, to kind of indicate the prior beliefs and um, and the context behind the why question. So, yeah, I, I think eventually he answers the question uh, very briefly, but like 99% of that is about how stupid the question is. And, um, but still, I think, uh, so I'm not gonna play it because uh, it's 10 minutes, 20 minutes long. So I suggest watching it if you like later on. Um, but the point is, uh, again, he's emphasizing the context dependency and uh, social nature of questions and counterfactual. Uh. Um, so from human perspective, we need why question um, to build trust and better user experience with the machine models. And for that, we need uh, three types of requirements. One is counterfactual, selective, social, interactive. If you ask me whether the current XI and XAI technologies um, living up to these three criteria, I would say no. Uh, there are not so many work uh, which is addressing all these three factors. There are some attempts, but uh, I think uh, the focus is not there. And that's, uh, that's one thing that we can uh, try to address in the future. There are some exciting research possibilities here. Okay, so let's move on to the practical usage perspective. Um, if you ask practitioners why do you need XAI, okay, they're going to cite a, a few um, use cases like mobile improvements and debugging in general. Um, but at the same time, they say they're not using it. Okay. So the question is, uh, what is missing from the current technology? And what can, uh, what can make them use it? It's almost tautological, but the first requirement is it should help the machine learning development. Okay? Uh, machine learning development is very difficult, so they're, they're, uh, people need a lot of help these days. So model debugging is notoriously difficult because of the reasons as follows. Um, it's hard to tell if the model is doing, could have done better, or it, it's kind of the maximal um, performance the model could, could get. Um, but nowadays we have scaling laws, if you are familiar with scaling laws. You kind of have um, kind of um, expected results when you train with such uh, number of parameters and number of trained data. You should get something like this perf performance. And that's actually helping uh, developers of uh, large models quite a bit. Uh, but without such a reference, it's really hard to tell whether you should spend more resources on fixing the model or um, you should be happy with the current model and move on to some other pressing um, issues. Um, even worse, you are sometimes not sure if the evaluation is wrong or if your model is doing wrong, right? Uh, maybe the evaluation is not focusing on um, focusing too much on like weird artifacts and um, the low performance here does not actually mean anything significant in practice. Um, but even if we clear out all these possible failure cases, uh, we are still not sure whether the model, e model is uh, actually having any problem or, right? Um, or if it's having a problem, you need to kind of know why the model is not achieving the best results. Um, and eventually the question is how to improve it further. And um, we are kind of expecting explanations to help with these kind of cases. Which means uh, it's not dramatically helping out the practitioners yet. So that's the task for ourselves. Um, for help, helping them, I think uh, we should answer these kind of why questions. First, why is the overall performance bad, for example? Uh, or why is the model failing on certain types of cases? Uh, or why does the model predict this on a particular case? So depending on these questions, uh, you have different focus, right? Whether you're focusing on a single case or um, a subset of cases or entire cases. Um, and to be helpful, actually helpful, right? 
um, I believe um, the, uh, the, the community should start with, the, uh, with practitioners rather than from intellectual curiosity. I mean, intellectual curiosity is great, but sometimes it doesn't really help with the, uh, the real world. Um, so what do I mean by top-down process? So you have to start with some problem definition. You have to talk to um, practitioners. Uh, you have to survey them. You have to dis make discussions. You have to talk to doctors. You have to talk to uh, model developers and so on and ask them uh, what kind of problems they have, what kind of help they need for debugging the models. And based on that, you identify a few uh, practical problems that you can address. And you go on to the second stage where you build the evaluation framework. Um, so there, you are formulating each task into a more research-friendly format, um, which is basically a evaluation benchmark and evaluation metrics. Because only if you have evaluation benchmark and metrics, um, you can kind of let researchers compete against each other and declare that we beat the others. And this is kind of the primary uh, uh, vehicle that makes uh, researchers contribute. <laughs> and um, eventually, having, having set up the evaluation framework, you're inviting researchers basically to contribute methods. And you can also yourself contribute your method. So I would say that's a very well motivated top down process of developing a technology. Uh, but I would say the current process is more bottom up, uh, which is not to blame some certain visual or a certain group of people, but this is how, how the nature is, right? Um, Researchers are a bunch of people who are intellectually curious and they are driven by uh, more curiosity than uh, actually solving the problem sometimes. Um, so they first jump into methods, right? They say, yeah, actually, if you look at uh, the input gradients, they seem to indicate where the model is looking at. And so I'll declare, yeah, this is an explanation of the internal behavior of a model. Uh, and then later on people realize, yeah, actually if, if you uh, look at practitioners, they are not using these techniques as much. Um, so we need to have a kind of sober look at uh, the current techniques and try to evaluate how well they are addressing the problem. So they, they build some evaluation benchmark and frameworks um, to evaluate them and declare, yeah, actually these are not um, addressing the problem. And then they do some fixes there by setting up a benchmark here and um, coming up with new methods that are kind of doing so much better than the other methods in terms of the evaluation uh, protocol you have here. But now, if you, uh, after some time, right, you bring these research outputs to actual practitioners again, and then they're still not using it, right? Um, that's because the, the benchmark is still not very well aligned with the practical use cases. So you know, like if you're going from bottom to top, um, you're wasting quite a bit of resources on something that's uh, not going to be used as much. Um, I, I'd like to uh, make a few more comments here about delving deeper into um, these questions. So you can ask questions like, uh, why is the overall performance bad? Um, because you wish to improve the model in general. Um, but if you ask this kind of question, uh, this is kind of hard to answer from XII perspective because um, there are typically so many causes for, uh, for a bad performance um, of a model. So I would say this is rather than a why question, a suitable why question, this is more like a, a typical kind of validation loop where people try different known technologies like data augmentation or uh, regularization to improve the model in general. You can still do it, but uh, that's not the main focus of XAI, I would say. Uh, what is perhaps more suitable for XAI research is um, trying to answer a question for a particular sim. 
So let's say there is a test sample of interest there. And um, here, the benefit is that the set of possible causes will be small. And so um, if you're citing these causes, uh, you're truthfully representing the true causes. So it's suitable for XAI. Um, depending on whether you're citing the cause from the test feature or from the training data, you have two different paradigms of XAI, uh, feature attribution or training data attribution. I'll talk about, that, talk about them later as well. Um, or you can also uh, try something in the middle. Um, you can try to explain the behavior of a group of test samples. But here what's important is to cluster the set of samples which are behaving in a similar way or uh, kind of have similar features. Because only then you have a manageable amount of uh, number of causes to cite. If, you're, if your subset is too heterogeneous, then again, your um, explanation may not be very useful. So to help the downstream task, um, you need to ask a question about specific cases, I would say. Um, and for, for um, evaluating whether the XAI is helping with the um, final task of model development, there are two ways of evaluating this whole thing. So one is end-to-end -end evaluation. Um, you have some XAI technique, and you try to measure whether eventually that technique is helping the practitioners uh, for their debugging. Um, but usually there's a human in the loop here. So um, it's more a direct measure, which is good. Uh, but at the same time, because this is uh, user dependent and also very much um, task dependent, um, the conclusion from this, like let's say XAI method A is better than B for a particular user and particular um, use case, um, but this ranking may not transfer very well to other cases. So that's the downside of this um, evaluation here. Um, the other paradigm is modular um, evaluations where you try to identify and evaluate common requirements shared by many, many um, possible downstream tasks. A good example of that is uh, faithfulness and efficiency, which I'm gonna talk about in the next slides. Um, you're gonna make some algorithmic um, yeah, evaluation here, which is also replicable and generalizable to different cases and stable. And um, it's based on quantity, so um, you're going to have um, numbers. Um, but of course, the downside is uh, probably this is not reflecting the practical use cases super well. Um, so I'm going to talk about faithfulness and efficiency as two other um, common uh, requirements for uh, XAI techniques. So these are kind of sort of universal requirements for many um, XAI in practice. So faithfulness or soundness or correctness, people use different terminologies here. It refers to the accuracy and reliability of explanations in reflecting the true mechanism. Um, so the model should, yeah, model is doing something inside and if your explanation is totally independent of what's actually going on inside. Even if that's super, um, super uh, understandable and clear and uh, yeah, uh, plausible, that's not useful, right? If it's not reflecting the true process. Uh, but there's a paradox here. Um, you're like setting the faithfulness metric means uh, you're eventually uh, pursuing perfect faith faithfulness. Um, but uh, if the faithfulness is, is at, uh, at, at perfection, that also means uh, you are actually 100% replicating the internal model mechanisms. Um, but that doesn't make sense because the reason why you need this explanation in the first place is because the internal mechanism is not understandable to humans. Um, so you cannot achieve best faithfulness and human understandability at the same time. So there should be some trade-off and balance here. 
Um, there is also efficiency, uh, which is required in all, um, yeah, all applications of computer science, I would say. Um, if you ask practitioners also why they not why they do not use any um, XAI technique, uh, one of the frequencies one of the most frequent uh, reasons they cite is because it takes time and it takes more resources. I'm busy with development models, so I don't want to um, spend more resources, like my, my time, on building something. Um, yeah, that's extra. Um, so, yeah, I'm pretty sure if they have to wait too long or spend too much money on this, then they're not going to use it at all. Um, so, you need to make sure that um, the time it takes to set up the XAI technique or the extra memory and storage or extra manpower they need is minimal. It's super critical. Uh, to summarize, for practical usage, I would say there are three key um, requirements. One is end-to-end -end usefulness, and the other one is soundness or faithfulness, uh, and third is efficiency. Yeah, so that's the full tree. Um, and based on that, I wish to kind of um, see whether the interpretable models that we had at the beginning admit good explanations. So this is, a, I'll say, a slightly subjective table from my viewpoint. Um, and therefore, this is not examinable. You should not memorize it. <laughs> it's my opinion. Um, so. There are criteria on the on the rows, right? You have counterfactual, selective, social, interactive, end-to-end, -end, useful, faithful, efficient, and you have uh, different models here: sparse linear, decision tree, enumeration, um, dense linear, two-layer neural network. Uh, let's see whether we can ask counterfactual questions for each model. If you have a sparse linear model, and let's say um, you try to change the um, the input a little bit. Um, you can easily answer what's going to happen if you for, for this change in the input by, um, by looking at the corresponding coefficient and saying, yeah, because uh, the rate of change for this input is this, um, I expect this change in the output. Likewise, for decision tree, you can also easily say, because of this feature, um, this node will be affected, and therefore the output will be different. But well, when it comes to, uh, let's say, a uh, two-layer neural network, it's so much harder to say that because, um, yeah, the, the neurons may be turned on for certain cases, um, but the neuron being turned on here does not necessarily mean some, uh, uh, yeah, foreseeable changes in the final output because of the other factor here as well. Um, so it's kind of hard to make, a, make an interpretable comment here. Uh, for selectiveness, uh, generally if the model is smaller and if the input size is smaller, it tends to be selective. Um, but for a neural network, yeah, it's not trivial again because um, the, the number of causes for the two-layer neural, net, neural network is not just the uh, input features but also complex composition of these in the hidden layer as well. So it's kind of hard. Uh, social and interactive and end useful, these are actually independent of the model itself. Um, it depends on the surrounding explanation module on top of that. Um, faithfulness, um, if the model itself is interpretable, uh, if you don't do anything stupid on top of that, your explanation should be faithful, right? You just present the model itself and it's faithful. Um, but if the model is not interpretable in the first place, there's a necessary gap between uh, explanation based on interpretable kind of surrogate model, I'll say, and the actual model. Um, efficient, if your model is inter interpretable in the first place, then there's no extra cost, of course. Um, but otherwise, there's some extra cost depending on the explanation. Yeah. And finally, I'd like to talk about uh, different types of explainability. 
there's feature attribution and training data attribution depending on where you're citing the causes. Um, yeah. So you can view model as a function of inputs, but actually um, a model is a function of two inputs. So one is the test input and the other one is the training data. So when you write down a model uh, function, you write down x and theta together to, um, to get the function output for test input x. Um, but if you think about parameter theta there, um, it's a function of training data. Well, there should be y as well, x train and y train. Yeah, but I missed that. But that's a small mistake. Um, so depending on whether you're citing the particular training test feature or training sample in the training set, you have either feature attribution or training data attribution paradigm. So in the first part of the section, this part, I'm going to talk about feature attribution. And in the second part, I'm going to talk about training data attribution. I tend to find training data attribution more interesting these days, by the way. Um, and there is a distinction between intrinsic model and postdoc model. Um, yeah, intrinsic explainability means the model itself is interpretable. Also, explainability means uh, the model itself is not interpretable, so you have to do something on top, post talk to make it interpretable again. And I briefly also talked about global versus local explainability. Global explainability tries to explain the whole um, cases, right? Um, but that is not always feasible because there can be a lot of different um, causes uh, for the global phenomenon. Uh, whereas if you go to specific samples, then the number of causes is limited and so explanation is much easier. Um, so one possible case where the global explainability still makes sense is again when you have a rather simple model. Um, I brought some um, disease dynamics model here. It's called SIR model, right? So uh, eventually the dynamics is defined by some uh, simple linear system, linear dynamical system. So that's why, uh, is it linear? No, it's not linear. <laughs> it's not linear dynamical system, but still uh, I would say you can understand what SI does, right? Uh, X times Y does. So I would say this is interpretable. Um, yeah, but uh, in general, XAI is more concerned with local explanations, I would say. And that's going to be our focus in this lecture as well. Oh, and finally, yeah, there is a, uh, this is really the final slide. So um, let's briefly comment on the current status of XAI techniques. So this paper from CHI 2021 uh, criticizes the current development of XAI uh, by saying, yeah, there is some um, interesting promises from XAI, but they tend to be ineffective, uh, potentially risky, and underused in the real world, right? I imagine all the reasons for that. Um, because people like to view this from a more technical point of view rather than the, from the end user point of view. So they need to talk to the, uh, the real people. So they frame this as solutionism or formalism, where they seek uh, more abstract mathematical solutions. So I believe uh, we should move away from that and have more practical solutions. OK, so in the last, next lecture, I'm going to talk about feature attribution. And then in the, in the following lecture, I'm going to talk about training data attribution. And for each case, I'm going to follow a more top-down approach, where we define task first and then evaluation, and then um, introduce corresponding methodologies. And this is the final slide. Um, please submit your feedback. Thank you.